Again, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Benji Cohn. It's Minnesota DNR. And we're on, I forget what episode it is, 46, I believe. And we're going to talk about bats today. So we had Melissa Bowman from the Minnesota DNR with us. So thank you so much for coming and talking about this. We get a lot of people registered today, and I'm super excited about it um, to learn a little bit more about bats. So. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have the opportunity to talk to everybody about bats. Um, they are, of course, my favorite mammal, so it's always nice to be able to share some interesting information about them. Um, as Benji said, my name is Melissa Bowman. I'm a mammal specialist with the Minnesota Biological Survey, and I've had the fortune of working with bats for the last five years with Minnesota DNR. Um, very quickly, they became my favorite once I started to learn about them and realized how much I didn't know about bats and how much they were not really talked about, even in the field of wildlife. Um, so I'm just going to give an overview of bats in Minnesota and some pretty special facts about them and what makes them really important. Um, my title is misinterpreted mammals because they are often um, they get a bad reputation or they're not really perceived uh, very well by the public. So I hope to change that by helping you guys learn about bats. Through this presentation. So, just to give a snapshot of some of the diversity of bats across the globe, they actually make up almost 20% of all mammals worldwide, and there's over 1,400 species in the globe. Now, just from this small photo set, you can see there's a lot of diversity across bats and how they look and some of the adaptations they have. Um, for their lifestyles. So, for example, you see some that have incredibly large ears that helps with hearing with echolocation and that's pretty particularly important for uh, insectivorous bats. And then you have these bats with extended muzzles and large eyes. Those are fruit eating bats. Uh, so they don't echolocate in the same way that our insect foraging bats do, um, but they primarily see at night with those large eyes. And then we've got bats that have striking coloration, like the Honduran white bat, uh, which is pure white, which you think would make it very obvious, but they tend to roost under leaves where the sun shines through and the green reflects off that white fur. So they actually blend in quite well with their surroundings. Um, there's bats that have long muzzles with long tongues for pollinating plants. Um, so they serve a wide variety of ecological functions across the globe. So, for example, the fruit eating bats, they're really important for seed dispersal and forest regeneration. They fly pretty large distances overnight, so that can help with seed dispersal. And this is especially important where uh, there's a lot of forest clearings happening, um, often for egg and things like that. So they're really important to that forest regeneration and sometimes even the local economies through that fruit production. And then there's pollinating bats, and some plants rely exclusively on bats for pollination. One of those plants includes the agave plant, so if you do enjoy the occasional margarita, you can thank a bat, um, since that agave is important for making tequila. They also help pollinate um, the tree of life, or the baobab tree in Africa, and it is called such because it provides food, nutrition, shelter, um, for people and animals in those ecosystems. And so this large, very important tree actually relies on bats for pollination of some of its flowers. Um, and then of course, there's the insectivorous bats, which consume a large number of insects for their small size. So this can really benefit forest health through maintaining populations of insects that otherwise in abundance might destroy the forest or um, prevent healthy trees from continuing to grow. Um, and they also help with agriculture uh, pest mitigation by eating some agricultural pests like corn borer or moss, um, thereby helping us potentially reduce the amount of pesticides that we have to actually use um, when controlling insects. So in Minnesota, we don't have the pollinating bats or the fruit eating bats. Those are found more in the South and in other countries, but our primary bats are the insectivorous bats, which we all know in Minnesota is incredibly important with the amount of insects we have. So just to give you a snapshot of who those bats are, we have eight documented species in the state. Um, they're typically grouped into two separate um, groups, one known as the cave bats. These are bats that are year round in Minnesota, so they will hibernate underground in caves. 
during the winter months, and then we have the migratory tree bats. Um, they're often called tree bats just because of the way they roost in the trees, even though all bats will use trees for roost. These bats typically hang on the outside of trees, um, look, using their camouflage to kind of blend like leaves in the trees. And so these bats will leave the state during the winter months and make long migrations to their overwintering areas. I'll talk about each species as I talk about some other important facts about bats um, that make them pretty important to study. So just a quick snapshot of where bats are during the year. So from the winter months, January to about mid-April, the bats that are migratory are not in the state, while the bats that are hibernating um, are in a deep hibernation, so they're not active during those winter months. In mid-April, we start to see bats returning to the landscape. We see the migratory bats starting to return to their summer areas, and we begin to see cave bats emerging from the hibernacula. That can be kind of a slow, emergence period, so it's not just suddenly that bats will come out, but they'll kind of test the temperatures. As we all know, April uh, in Minnesota can be pretty variable. We can have harsh winters continuing sometimes, or we get those nice early springs. Then from May through August, that's the pup season. So this is when bats are having pups and raising the next generation. It's a pretty short window for bats that are actually active in Minnesota compared to year round. So you can see the primary time they are active is in the pup season from early May, late April until late August, early September when they start to move towards their wintering habitat. So we see the migratory bats start to leave at this time as well. And then fall swarming will begin. And that is when bats begin to move to their overwintering sites, also called hibernacula and begin to mate. So it's actually kind of interesting, the reproduction timeline for bats in that they will typically mate in the fall, but they will not give birth until the spring. So they experience delayed fertilization or implantation until they uh, emerge from hibernation or return to their summer grounds. The pups that are born in May and June are completely dependent on the parents like most mammals are. Um, they're dependent on their mother's milk and her warmth for thermal regulation. And so those pups completely rely on the mother until they're able to fly. And even then they start to learn how to forage from her um, before they will end up leaving the roost and start moving towards the winter areas. Typically you'll see a spike or we'll see a spike in reports of bats in those transition periods from April to May and from August to September. The migration is uh, a pretty extraneous process for bats. So often we'll get reports of bats roosting in odd places, maybe just on the side of a building uh, or roosting on a window screen, some obvious place where you wouldn't typically expect to see a bat. And that's usually they're just trying to rest while they're in this big migration push. So, um, the flight adaptation of bats. So just to point out one bat, our hoary bat is the largest in Minnesota, and they have a wingspan up to 14 inches across. Um, and so if you look at the illustration, you can see the skeletal structure and how bats are actually adapted to fly. So it's actually an extension of their hands that makes up their wings. So you can see how similar their skeletal structure looks to us as humans, except it's the hands that come out and make up the wings. Um, so it's pretty unique. They're actually the only mammal capable of flight. And even though there are mammals like flying squirrels, they use a method called gliding where they're not actually in control of flight, um, but bats are the unique mammal capable of that flight. So that is one reason why they're so diverse across the globe because they were able to move into all these niche areas where other mammals couldn't access um, food sources and whatnot. So we are very fortunate to have that diversity of bats across the globe, thank to, thankfully to their ability to fly. So for migration, I'm just pointing out the silver-haired bat. That's one of our migratory species. Uh, it's named such for the black fur it has with silver tips on its back. Um, over to the right, I have a range map showing where this bat can be found um, throughout any period of the year. So you can see it extends as far down into Mexico. 
So for bats in Minnesota that migrate, it is not known exactly where they go, but it is known that they can go as far south as Mexico. Uh, and that's one area of study we would like to learn a lot more about is where are the migratory bats actually going, which is difficult to study. So the silver-haired bat can go that far south, same with the hoary bat. And then our eastern red bat, another migratory bat, tends to go to the southeastern part of the U.S. where they will experience a mild hibernation and can be found hibernating underneath leaf litter during the winter months. So the northern long-eared bat, that is a federally threatened species in Minnesota um, or across the U.S. it's listed as federally threatened. It unfortunately has experienced very large declines in recent years, um, which I'll talk about why in a minute here, but it's named for its very long ears. So it is a myotis, which is very closely related to our little brown bat, but the way to distinguish the two is those very long ears and then a piece of the ear that we call the tragus, um, which is a triangular part in the middle. We have a tragus as well, and that can help you ID that species. So in Minnesota, we did a study looking at the habitat use of female northern long-eared bats. Um, to do this, we tracked them with radio telemetry so that we could see where they were roosting at night um, and during the day. So we typically tracked them to these large diameter trees that were declining, um, such as you see in these photos. They've got loose bark, cavities, crevices for the bats to tuck into. And with the high solar exposure, these roosts can stay really warm, which is really important for the pups that these bats are raising. And so looking at these trees, you can see they're large, sometimes decaying dead trees on the landscape, which can often be temporary. So these bats used a network of roost trees rather than sticking to one tree, they would move almost nightly, which means moving their pups to these different roosts as well to maintain this network of roost trees that they use. So bats actually exhibit a pretty strong spatial memory, um, which has been studied a little bit. And so to remember where all these roost trees are, as well as where the winter habitat is, being that this is a cave bat, um, it's pretty interesting to study the spatial memory in bats and how it works in their brains. This can kind of help us understand how our brain processes work and can even give us insights into say diseases like Alzheimer's, which usually depletes some of the brain structures that help us with spatial memory. So studying that in bats can actually help us understand our own brains as well. So the little brown bat, this used to be the most common bat in Minnesota, and it was likely if you were seeing some bats flying at night that it was probably little brown bats. Um, this is no longer the case, unfortunately. But the little brown bat is an extremely long, long-lived species. So my supervisor, Gerda Nordquist, banded one of these bats in April 1983 in Wisconsin. And the same individual was found in 2015, so 32 years later, still alive, still living in the cave system. And this is pretty phenomenal for such a small mammal with a high metabolism. When you think about other small mammals with high metabolisms like rodents, they typically live a max of three to five years. So 32 years is a pretty big anomaly for such a small animal. Once, once a bat is an adult, it is impossible to age them. So you can't really, there's no indicators to really tell how old a bat is other than having a unique ID such as the band. And what a band looks like on a bat is pictured to the right there. It's usually a little metal ring that is stuck to the forearm of the bat just above the wrist so that it stays on and you can later pick out that ID just like you would um, with a bird band or something similar like that. Um, so that's a pretty unique adaption and kind of shows that bats live a different life than most small mammals. So they're long lived and they're slow reproducers, which is a much different life strategy than we see with small mammals that are short lived and often have a lot of young. So um, the eastern red bat, that is my favorite species personally in Minnesota. They're very striking with red fur. Um, they can have up to three pups, so that's quite a bit. You can see this bat on the left has her hands full with three pups hanging onto her. And it's pretty amazing because these bats um, pictured on the right, 
will roost in trees and they just kind of hang on the outside and they'll hang out with their pups and they'll leave the pups there when they go to forage at night. So I put a note here about um, babbling bats. There was a recent study that just came out about the greater sack wing bat and researchers found that the young were babbling essentially starting to learn songs that they would use as adults later. And this is the same behavior that we observe in human babies of babbling to learn language. So very distinct syllables being used that later make up language, uh, words in humans cases or songs in the case of these greater sac bats. So studying this ability for bats to babble can actually give us insights into the genes that are used for language learning. So it actually ex extends pretty well across species to learn how language can develop uh, in different animals. And then the big brown bat, this is now our most common bat in Minnesota. So definitely the reports I receive about bats usually involve the big brown bats. Um, now when you see bats flying, that's likely who you're seeing uh, flying around. They're the most common because they are pretty hardy bats. So they're able to overwinter in homes uh, in the winter versus the other cave bats, which are required to overwinter in those hibernacula due to the stable temperatures. But because big brown bats can tolerate some colder temperatures, even down to freezing, um, they've done quite well in the recent years. So in hibernation, bats experience something called torpor. And this is where they completely shut down their metabolic systems, their immune systems uh, to make it through the winter with no insects, no food, um, and kind of relying on the fat reserves that they've built up over the summer. So it's a pretty um, interesting ability and kind of unique for a hibernation strategy in that they are one of the deepest hibernators um, that we know about. They will have periods of activity in the winter, but it's very um, not common for them to be super active in the winter. So they utilize this torpor strategy to basically make it through without any food and insect ability or in ability to eat insects in the winter. And then echolocation. So just highlighting the tricolor bat. This is our smallest bat in Minnesota. Um, it's a cave bat, so it will overwinter and it weighs about five grams, which is about the size of a nickel. So it's a very small, lightweight bat. Um, over to the right, I have kind of an example of an echolocation call of a tricolor bat. And this is just a sonograph showing what those pulses actually look like. So it's pulses that the bat will emit that is bounced off objects and it's received back to the bat, giving it information about the location of that object, the texture, uh, the size, and all sorts of information. So studying echolocation in bats, we've been able to improve some of our own technology systems, such as radar and sonar. And looking at, if you think about bats foraging in an area, there might be many bats at one time. So how does a bat avoid interference with their own navigation system when there's so much going on with other bats um, calling in the areas too? And it turns out bats will actually adjust their echolocation calls and frequencies. So they'll adjust the volume, the shape of their pulses, uh, the amplitude, and change all these features to avoid having those uh, navigation systems blocked. So we can actually learn from that with our own um, radar and sonar systems of how to improve that and avoid interference with those technologies by looking at how bats avoid interference with their own navigation systems. And then another species, the evening bat, uh, it looks a lot like the big brown bat, but it's about half the size. And so this was a new species to Minnesota as of 2016. Um, it was captured during the Northern Longyear bat study, and it was a female that was lactating, meaning that she likely had a pup in the area. So this was a very interesting observation. Typically their range is more south uh, and the expansion into Minnesota is an expansion northward. We're also seeing that starting to occur in Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, more detections of this uh, migratory bat, it's believed to be migratory. Um, and so we still have so much to learn about bats and the evening bat is a good example of that. We don't know 
where it really overwinters. It's never really been documented in cave systems. And um, we don't really know if it migrates somewhere down south during the summer. So there's still a lot to know about just basic biology about this species, but also many species. Um, for example, the tricolored bat, it's not clear what is their preferred habitat in the summer or what trees they like to really use. Um, we don't often detect them in Minnesota in the summer, and that might be getting harder with the declines of bats we are seeing. To the right is just an example of what a radio transmitter looks like for studying bat movement. Um, this is a piece of equipment that can be glued to the back of a bat, and then we can use telemetry where we're on the ground with a receiver tracking where that location of the bat is. That is how we did the study on the northern long-eared bats to track them to roost trees. Um, and while this is great to have this piece of technology to study bats, there's a lot of limiting factors. So for example, trying to study migration or when bats are moving long distances across the landscape, it can be really difficult to do with radio telemetry. It's hard to keep up with the bats. They do move pretty fast and move long distances overnight, um, especially when they are migrating. Uh, so kind of the lack of technology for studying such a small mammal definitely leaves a lot of questions about just basic biology that is really understood about a lot of other animals. So I'm looking forward to just seeing how technology advances um, to aid the study of bats and be able to better understand some of basic ecology about them. So after giving you all this information about why bats are important beyond just eating insects um, and what other things they can help provide us just by studying them, uh, it's important that we care. And that is because white nose syndrome, uh, it's a disease that affects cave hibernating bats that has caused, caused a lot of mortality uh, since its arrival to the US. Um, it specifically only impacts cave hibernating bats due to that unique life cycle of uh, going into torpor for the whole winter. And as I mentioned, their immune systems are shut down. So that gives the opportunity for the causative fungus um, known as Suedogymnoascus destructans to infect the tissues of those bats. So it's caused by a fungus that is non-native to the US uh, it has been documented in caves in Europe, and it is um, hypothesized that somehow the fungus arrived to the U.S. maybe from um, here, maybe from somebody going into a cave where it was in Europe and coming into a cave in the U.S. It's not really known how it got here, but either way, it jumped from Europe um, to North America. So white nose only affects the cave bats, as I mentioned, um, due to that torpor cycle. And so when it first arrived, biologists started to see sites like this on the left, um, where there was mass mortality and it was not understood why all these bats were dying in the middle of winter. Just to show you a map of how that has spread across North America since it arrived. So it arrived in 2016, which is only about 15 years ago. Um, but since then, it has spread very rapidly westward, and it reached Minnesota by 2015-2016. So this color just kind of indicates how quickly it moved westward, um, likely due to bats, for example, moving among hibernacula, socializing with each other. As I mentioned in the fall, they will swarm outside cave entrances. So that could have been a potential avenue for the spread of the fungus into different cave systems and the fungus thrives really well in those cave systems. So once it establishes, it's pretty quickly that we start to see um, bats getting sick with white nose syndrome. So it typically will be about three years from the first detection of the fungus to starting to see actual bats that are sick. So in Minnesota, um, the first detection was in Sudan mine in 2015-2016. And Sudan mine is one of our largest hibernacula for bats. It was estimated that over 15,000 bats overwintered at the site pre-white nose syndrome. Uh, since it's arrived through our hibernacula surveys, we've been able to document, unfortunately, a 97% decline uh, since 2015, 2016 of bats that are overwintering at the site. Um, so very quickly in the subsequent years, we began detecting it in other cave systems. You can see kind of an outlier in Becker County to the west. 
And that actually came from a homeowner who had reported finding multiple dead bats in early April uh, returning to the house, which was believed to be a summer roost. And so when we sent those bats in for testing, it was determined that they had white nose syndrome. And though they weren't found in the cave system, um, that county was confirmed due to the bats being in that county when they were detected with white nose syndrome. Um, so you kind of see it's concentrated on the eastern edge of Minnesota, and that is mostly because that's where our cave systems are for bats. To the west, we don't really have the natural hibernacula um, that we see on the eastern edge of Minnesota. And so there's some gaps in the counties there, but that is due to either not having a site that we can access, um, or at this point, we no longer take bats um, from caves to confirm them with white nose syndrome, but instead just rely on observations um, to determine that they have white nose syndrome. So you can see in the photo to the right where the name comes from, and that comes from the fungus infecting those tissues on the bats. So it will typically infect the skin, which would be the muzzle, the ears, and the forearms. So you can see that white growth of the fungus giving that name white nose syndrome. Typically when bats are in the hibernacula, that is when you see images like this. Um, but as soon as they wake up, they will groom the fungus off. So if a bat is outside of a cave system, it is very rare that you would actually see the fungus growth on it. Um, as once they're active, they try to groom their, themselves um, and typically remove the visual evidence of white nose syndrome. So I mentioned we do hibernacula surveys to help monitor the bat population in Minnesota and monitor the spread of white nose syndrome. So when I first started with DNR, uh, that was about the time that white nose arrived. At the top, we see a photo of Mystery Cave, which is also an important hibernacula for bats in southeastern Minnesota. And this was more what you would see would be multiple bats dotting the walls. So we don't really have huge clusters like you sometimes see in southeastern U.S., but we would have quite a few bats here um, hibernating in the caves. After just a couple of years, about three years later, the bottom picture is what we're seeing more so now. So there's just three little bats that you can see uh, hanging on the cave wall there. And it's pretty unfortunate to see such a rapid decline of our overwintering bats. Um, in just such a short period of time. So while I feel fortunate to be working on bats and be studying them, it is kind of devastating to just see the loss um, that has occurred over the couple of years that white nose has been in the state. So why is it such a concern? Um, infected hibernacula can experience up to 99% mortality. And this is huge for uh, a species that is long lived and slow reproducing. That's not something that bats will be able to just bounce back from. Um, you know, if a disease like this maybe went through a population of mice or, or rabbits or something that reproduces more quickly, it may not be as much of a concern, but because of how rapidly the mortality occurs and how intensely it can occur, um, is really devastating for our cave bats. As I mentioned, bats are slow reproducers. So having one pup a year is not gonna rebuild the population after such a large crash. So unfortunately, while we've had um, very large populations pre white nose, we probably won't see those numbers return to where they were in our lifetime, if not you know, a couple generations past us. Um, so it's really devastating how white nose has impacted bats. And of course, because they provide really important ecosystem services to us, especially with insect control, um, this is pretty devastating. So for solutions, um, researchers have worked really hard to try to find um, some way to mitigate all the mortality that's associated with white nose syndrome. So they have looked at volatile organic compounds to inhibit the growth of the fungus. And they did find uh, the rhodococcus bacteria, which is used on bananas to help them um, stay fresh longer, did help prevent uh, the fungus PD from growing. Um, 
So that was one potential option. Can we apply those bacteria to cave systems to prevent the fungus from growing? However, logistically, that's really challenging. Uh, we can't access every crevice um, in cave systems where bats are going, where the fungus is likely thriving. And then we have to think about the natural cave flora and fauna that are already occurring in the cave that should be there. We want to be really careful about applying treatments that would disturb that natural ecosystem. So they've also looked at UV light. So UVC light uh, when shown on the fungus, um, you can see in this photo, it's depicted as the orange dots on the bat's wing. Uh, so the UV light can potentially kill the fungus and prevent it from growing on bats. So could you install say a light at a cave entrance where bats are passing through that would help uh, kill any fungus that is on the bats so helping to prevent spread to new cave systems where maybe pd hasn't been discovered yet um, but again this is very logistically challenging as uh, most cave systems and most openings are not small cracks that um, perfectly can be exposed to uv light to help prevent the fungus from thriving in there and then you would have to have that there constantly. So you would have to provide a power source um, in a lot of cave, sy cave systems or not in areas where you can provide that. So then they were looking at potentially vaccinating bats, which is really difficult to do. There are very few vaccinations uh, for fungus diseases on the landscape. So there was a lot of research looking into the potential for vaccinations. Now, the hard part with that there is that you would have to vaccinate each individual bat, um, which is pretty difficult to capture. Um, you know, every bat that would be in a cave system and then you start to mess with their immune system and potentially things that are helping them actually survive uh, white nose syndrome. So. The next solution is, do we leave it to the bats? Because there are a small percentage of bats that are surviving. Um, and it has been discovered that bats that have survived white nose, not white nose syndrome actually have genes that maybe help with better fat storage. So for example, the bats that can store more fat are more likely to survive the winter um, and not fall prey to mortality from white nose syndrome because they don't lose all their reserves. Um, the reason white nose syndrome is so effective is that it causes bats to wake up more frequently in the winter, which can cause them to deplete uh, those important fat reserves. So they essentially starve to death. Um, so those few bats that do survive will likely contribute genetics to the next generation that will help them survive the disease as well. So we want to make sure that we're not taking away that capability for bats naturally to reproduce and pass on those uh, surviving genes. So while white nose syndrome is only devastating our cave bats, um, thankfully the migratory bats are not impacted by white nose syndrome since they aren't uh, roosting in the caves for the winter. However, they are impacted by wind energy similar to migratory birds. Um, there's been a lot of mortality of bats um, at wind farm sites. And though the research is just now kind of catching up, we don't really know how much this has impacted our bat populations. Again, there's so much we don't know about bats, including what the population levels are, especially for migratory bats. For cave bats, we can at least go into the cave systems and count them during the winter to understand what our populations are in those areas. But for migratory bats, they're a lot harder to study being that they don't typically group up like the cave bats do. So now with acoustics, uh, we are just now starting to be able to establish trends for our bat species, including um, unfortunately declining trends. So one paper recently published um, found evidence of region-wide declines of hoary bats um, over multiple years, thanks to the acoustics um, recording the echolocation calls of bats. Uh, so unfortunately, I think we've been unaware of how much uh, impact the migratory bats have had due to that mortality from wind turbines, um, but we are just now starting to gather evidence to better understand that. So how can you help? Um, 
I think the most important part of bat conservation is changing attitudes about bats. They're really misunderstood animals. And unfortunately, when animals are disregarded or not appreciated, there are much less conservation efforts for them or research surrounding them um, or even desire to potentially do some projects that might help bats. Uh, so there's so much we still don't know about bats. And I think that is a reflection of kind of the attitudes that even researchers had for bats. Prior to white nose syndrome, there wasn't much going on. There's, you know, a few groups focused on doing bat work, but ever since the disease arrived and we realized how serious it was and how much mortality was happening and how our populations were diminishing, there was a much higher effort um, put into understanding our bats and the populations that we had pre white nose syndrome. Um, so I think just changing attitudes about bats is incredibly important. Um, so hopefully some things from my talk today will help kind of motivate you to learn more about bats and share that with people in your life. Um, so leaving dead trees where possible, those are natural roost for bats, incredibly important for those females that are reproducing in the summer. Um, that will be really important for bats to be able to at least stabilize uh, instead of continue to decline is those females that are surviving white nose syndrome to continue to reproduce. Uh, you can also plant native vegetation, um, just like for pollinators, uh, for pollinating insects anyway. Uh, you can support the food sources for moths and other animals or other insects that bats do consume. Um, protecting roost sites and hibernacula. So protecting hibernacula might look like staying out of cave systems during the winter when it, bats are in a really vulnerable um, period. So we want to avoid disturbing bats during the winter months so that they continue to hibernate um, because every time they wake up, it's very costly and causes them to burn a lot of fat. Uh, so protecting roost sites might look like um, maybe you have an old barn that has bats in it and you're okay with the bats using that barn. Um, otherwise, if you do have bats in a building, uh, using bat friendly methods to remove them from the building rather than using uh, poisons or traps is really important. So you can do what's called an exclusion where you put up devices that allow all the bats to exit, but not re-enter the roost. Um, so kind of maintaining those summer populations will be really important. Reducing pesticide use, um, of course, chemicals in the environment can have a negative impact on our mammals. Um, so especially using pesticides to control insects around the, your area or around your yard might um, negatively impact the bats in that area. And then considering a bat house. So bat houses, I think, are really important for those summer colonies that are reproducing. Um, but in the past, there's been a lot of designs that have been promoted as successful, uh, but maybe actually aren't beneficial to bats. So for example, that might look like a really small bat box that's painted black and that is in full sun. Uh, we're starting to document more cases of overheating in bat houses. So for example, this summer when it was really hot in Minneapolis, um, I did receive a, port, a report, unfortunately, of some bats that were falling out of a bat house um, with pups due to the high heat. And unfortunately, there was some mortality with that. So we really wanna avoid putting designs up that are actually not as beneficial to bats. So there's two designs that we um, tried to promote for putting up, and that's a four chamber nursery box and a rocket box. If you want to put up a bat house, try to avoid buying one that's from a vendor um, that's maybe very general. Like, for example, I've seen some bat houses at Menards, and those structures are usually really small, um, painted black, and not ideal for bats. So, if you are considering putting up a bat house, it's really important to just think about what designs you are providing to bats. And then you can help us by submitting information as well. So I mentioned um, being able to detect a colony of bats that had white nose syndrome in Becker County, and that was thanks to our uh, bat observation report. So I'm really interested in learning more about where our colonies are in Minnesota. 
and how they're faring, especially post white nose syndrome. So if you know of a maternity colony, you can report it to us at our bat observation report. Um, additionally, if you have a bat box, I'm really interested to know how the bat box has worked. If maybe you didn't have any success, no bats use the box. That's just as important as knowing, um, you know, about boxes that actually have a maternity colony in them. And then you can visit our DNR website for more information about um, any bats. And with that, I will open it up to questions. That was probably a lot of information thrown at you guys. So hopefully there's some, some questions in there. You get a lot of great questions. I was actually just trying to find a bat box plan site. Uh, somebody asked about repeating the choices of bass, bat boxes, the rocket box. And what was the other one? You yeah, so I'm hoping to get our DNR website updated with that information. Um, but there's two recommended designs and that is the rocket box and the four chamber nursery. So typically a single chamber nursery was promoted a lot, um, which looks exactly the same as a four chamber, except it's only got a single slot for the bats versus multiple slots in a four chamber. And if you're looking for the plans for those, you can go to batconservationinternational.org. So it's batcon.org. Awesome. Uh, maybe James or one of you put that up in the chat. We'll put a link to that resource in there for people. So we had a lot of great questions. A lot of um, ones about bat houses. I think you did a great job of describing that. A lot of them about the impact of like the Metro uh, Mosquito Control District. Gil was asking about if that, if you've seen any impact on the bat population from the Metro Mosquito Control activities. Yeah, so we haven't directly um, been able to document something like that. Um, that would be a very specific research project to focus on. Um, but, you know, mosquitoes do make up a portion of bats' diets. And so they could be impacted negatively by either consuming um, or, you know, being in an area where the spraying is going on, um, especially if it's going on in the evening, could negatively impact bats. If it's water treatment, for example, for mosquitoes, it's probably less likely to impact the bats. Um, but the lower mosquitoes wouldn't necessarily be uh, that detrimental to bats, being that they make up a, a portion of bats' diets, but they also consume a lot of other insects. And, and along the insect lines, uh, Shane was asking about if there's any studies relating bats to emerald ash borer killed trees population effects? Yeah, I haven't seen any yet um, directly linking them to the emerald ash borer, but I know it's kind of a expanding field of study to see actually um, which insects bats are consuming that are the most beneficial to forests. So there's uh, one study that's going on in the southeastern U.S. where they're excluding bats from the forest canopy and having treatment plots where they have um, it available to bats to forage and already through their results, they've seen uh, more defoliation in the plots where bats were excluded from versus the plots where bats were not excluded. So more defoliation being more insects consuming, especially younger growing trees. So preventing those trees from growing into larger trees without those bats present. Interesting. Has there been studies like that for other insects, like mosquitoes and stuff too, without the bats being present, there's more mosquito issues? Um, no, not yet. There's so much opportunity for research um, in bats. Like this forest plot study, for example, is the first that I know of where they are actually focusing on bats alone versus, um, you know, other studies have excluded birds as well, which kind of confounds those results of, well, is it the birds or the bats that's actually making the difference? So it's pretty a, kind of a new field of study trying to understand how bats actually impact the community beyond just saying they eat insects. Okay. And uh, Tim was asking, is there other tips for attracting bats to your property? If like, he is a lake house, they might want to attract bats too, other than putting a house up. Is there any other additional tips you'd have? 
Yeah, unfortunately, the roost is the main way to attract bats to your yard. Um, if you put up a bat box that they, you know, that has the conditions that they like, um, the rock, rocket box, for example, has been shown to have a lot of preference by bats and they'll move in. They can move in quickly if you put up a structure that um, works well. But I think just also letting insects be in your yard and avoiding using chemicals, you're more likely to have bats foraging around than if you were spraying or, um, you know, kind of putting chemicals in your yard to prevent insects from existing there too. Great. Uh, man, questions are coming in left and right. So we'll see how many we can get through here in the next few minutes. Uh, Janine asked, are you aware of any overwintering bat habernaculas that have been constructed by people to help support bat populations? Yeah, so um, over in Nantucket Island, there's northern long-eared bats that would hibernate in the basements or cellars of these old houses. Um, and of course, most people didn't want the bats hibernating in their basements. Uh, so this was a kind of novel study where they tried to construct these artificial hibernacula um, that resembled those basement cellar structures for northern long-eared bats. And so they were able to construct these um, basement-like structures and actually did have some northerns that wound up overwintering in them. So that's kind of the first artificial hibernacula that's been created for bats. But of course, cool. artificial could also be considered a mine, like Sudan mine, for example. I suppose if anybody's been up, hasn't been up there, that's my favorite state park in the state of Minnesota. I love that place. Yeah, if you have so. not been, absolutely check it out. It's an awesome place and you can do a tour of the mine and everything, which is a really cool experience. Uh, another question from Heather, uh, should bat houses be cleaned? And she Great had a couple, question. Yeah, she had a couple questions that on that. Researchers are starting to look more at. Um, it's always been, you know, kind of said that if you put up a bat house, it's low maintenance and you don't need to clean them. Um, where cleaning might be important is considering ectoparasites. So bat bugs, um, bugs that will essentially, you know, parasitize bats, they can actually survive freezing temperatures and survive in the winter. So there's some discussion in the bat community of, are we creating these, um, you know, potential traps where bats are returning to the box every year and because the bat bugs can overwinter in the box, they could hypothetically accumulate over the years in the box, which would be detrimental to pups in the box. So there is a question of if bat boxes should be cleaned out um, due to the ectoparasite loads. But as of now, the recommendation is still, eh, you don't really have to. And Heather also asked, is, is there any artificial insemination or breeding programs at zoos to, to help with population in bats? Nope, not that I know of. Um, so for bats, their reproduction is really uh, very temperature dependent. So I mentioned they mate in the fall and then they'll overwinter and they'll actually store the sperm and wait to fertilize until they begin to arouse in the spring. Then once the females arouse, they start to go to their hibernation grounds. Um, you know, as pregnant females, they need to consume a lot of insects too. And then those bats will go into torpor, which can literally pause the development of the fetus due to the cold temperatures. Um, so there hasn't really been any work in the lab to try to artificially bring those populations back, but it would likely be pretty difficult being that, you know, bats only have one pup a year. It'd be a very intensive effort. Yeah. And you might have to go back to, I think you played your contact information up there a slide ago. But oh yeah, I can. Bring Cheryl had a question on here that she may have to reach out to you. So she has a bat living in a folded patio umbrella, and it seems to stay all year long. How can she safely remove it without harming it? She thinks it's a brown bat, and when is the best best month to close up the umbrella and hope it can find a better home? So if it's a closed umbrella, those are. Bats love those. Um, so that's probably a male that's roosting signally in the umbrella. 
And really the only thing you could do if it's already in there, um, you know, once it leaves at night, close off the access to that umbrella. So if you can, you know, either close off the bottom or tighten it. If it's an open umbrella that the bat is roosting in, then the only way to really prevent it from roosting there is to just remove the umbrella. Um, unfortunately, when bats do find a good suitable roost, they tend to be pretty fidelic and will return to that roost knowing that they're safe in there and it provides a good temperature for them. But if she wants the bat to stay, she could also move the umbrella off to an area where she doesn't use it, but it still gets the sun exposure it has. Can be a new umbrella bat house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Danielle had a question, and there's a couple other questions on this. I'll tie in, but um, she was wondering if we could explain a little bit more on the locators and how they're put on the bats, and if they hurt the bats or hinder their ability to fly. They look kind of heavy. Another question, kind of related to that, was the range of a bat. So. Yeah. So um, the little radio transmitters, they're about the size of my pinky nail, they're pretty small and they are, um, you know, about 5% of the bat's body weight. And that is the limit for putting any technology onto an animal um, is that 5% threshold since other studies have shown that it doesn't Im negatively impact the bat's ability to navigate, to fly, anything like that. So there's been a lot of research done on the research methods themselves before you actually use that technology on bats in the wild. Um, so those are just very small. And what we do is just snip the hair off the back and we use a surgical glue that holds the transmitter on the bat. Eventually that glue kind of wears away and the transmitter will fall off after about 14 days. Um, so by picking up the signal, we can then pick up the location of the bat, which is often just with radio telemetry, you hear a beep. Um, indicating the direction of that animal. So if I'm pointing my uh, receiver in the direction of the bat, the beeps will be a lot louder than if I'm pointing off to the side or a different direction, it'll be quieter. So then you literally locate the bat using um, the volume of the beeps that you're hearing. And then for the range of bats, as far as how far they can fly, um, I mean, we have bats statewide in the summer, including little brown bats that are all the way on the western part of Minnesota. Um, those bats could hypothetically go into South Dakota, uh, but you know they have to migrate pretty far distances to get to hibernacula on the eastern side of Minnesota too. Um, so they can fly pretty far and it's not really well known what those distances are because of the inability to really track bats. Um, with just radio telemetry, it's pretty limited. You wanna make sure they're kind of staying in a range because if they do take off and fly, it's gonna be really hard to locate that signal. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, they've tried yeah. to do studies where they track bats from their summer foraging grounds to their winter sites and they've literally had to get out planes to try to follow the bats. Um, because they do move such large distances when they're migrating. Wow. It's kind of like the movie with the uh, boy that flew with the geese, right? You know, fly oh, with the yeah. bats. Is there weight no syndrome like in Mexico where they would bring this back from their summer or their overwintering grounds? They would bring it back north. Is that a possibility too? Or? Um, not likely because the migratory bats that are going down there aren't going into cave systems as much. So, for example, from the map, you could see that in Texas, there is white nose syndrome and PD detected, but it's not known if the bats, you know, down further south where there's not really such an extreme winter will actually get the disease. They might get the fungus on them, but it's unknown yet how they'll fare in those southern areas with PD. Okay. Jeff was wondering if you could touch a little bit on bats as vectors for human diseases like rabies or coronaviruses or any of that. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, bats have a pretty incredible immune system just due to the fact that they fly. So that's really costly and the act of flight itself can cause a lot of inflammation within the body. So bats bodies are always trying to basically reduce inflammation. 
um, which means that they can often coexist with viruses and diseases. Um, for rabies, it's kind of a myth that, you know, like all bats are rabid and they kind of have the bad reputation for rabies because it's actually more like 1% of bats that are actually carrying the disease. Um, but in any case, whenever you come in contact with a wild animal, you shouldn't, you know, be using bare hands to touch it, um, allowing yourself to get bit or to, you know, be exchanging fluids in any way with that animal. So you just always need to be cautious when you come in contact or when you see an animal on the ground or acting weird in any way. Um, as far as coronaviruses, that can be kind of a whole other topic, obviously, because of the pandemic we went through. Um, but it comes down to a lot of habitat availability. And the more we encroach on wildlife, the more we're going to be coming in contact with diseases, not just from bats, but from all different types of animals. Yeah. So we get, we're just about out of time. So apologies, we're not going to get to everybody's question, but if it's, if it's pressing, I'm sure you can reach out to Melissa and, and contact her. Now we had a couple questions relating to bat boxes. Again, how long does it take for bats to find a bat box once I have it up? And how do I know that bats have found it and are actually using it and living in it? Yeah, that's a great question. So it can vary quite a bit because you may put up a bat house and not see anybody, but the following year, a colony gets evicted from their roost and lo and behold, they move into your bat box because it was available. I would say if you've had a box up for, you know, a couple of years, like three years or something, and you're still not seeing bats using it, it'd be good to change something about it, either change the placement of it or put up a different design that might be um, more preferable for bats. So for a research project I did this summer, we installed bat boxes in April and by June, I saw bats starting to use the box. So it can also be pretty quickly, um, you know, kind of depending on your area and the bat activity in your area. That's great. And I listened to part of this yesterday in our practice session and, and learned how old bats are and how much they migrate, which I wasn't, that astounds me how old a bat can live. And I learned today that every time I go have a margarita, I'm going to think of bats now. So yes. thank you so much for joining us and, and uh, enlightening us more about bats. They're fascinating little creatures. And thank you for everyone joining us. We're going to have to cut the questions off there um, just because we're running out of time. So, but thank you for attending the MOSS programs. Uh, just a reminder that next week, we have uh, Kelsey Lashar is going to be talking about the chronic wasting disease in our deer population. It's an important topic while deer season is coming up. And just a reminder, too, this weekend, trapping season starts in Minnesota. So any trappers out there or uh, people want to get out and experience that a little bit, uh, this is the weekend to get started. So, Melissa, thanks again so much for joining us. And if anybody does have more questions, they can reach out to you and be super appreciate your your willingness to come on and share this interesting topic with us so yeah absolutely so uh thanks everybody with that we're going to end the recording and um we'll see you next week